Guru Nation, thank you so much for watching. Make sure you like, subscribe, comment, share. It really means a lot to me. Today I got asked actually a really good question, believe it or not, from all places, Instagram. And by the way, my Instagram and my TikTok have been my fastest growing platforms. Thank you guys so much for following me there. And if you're not following me there, make sure you do, especially on TikTok. I post a lot of stuff that it doesn't make it uh, anywhere else because TikTok's its own platform. You got to respect each platform individually. Today's question comes from Instagram and it says, do you have a video that goes into detail on how patient data is collected at a clinical trial? Like from the point the patient leaves the house, goes to the site for a scheduled visit, their data is collected, recorded into the CRF and then entered into the EDC, something like that. I really want to understand how the data flows from the patient up to the data entry into the EDC, where it's used for statistical analysis. So this is a great, I can't believe I've never done this. And all you data nerds out there, or even just people wanting to learn the process. I mean, we kind of cover it briefly, but in this book, but this is like requires its own maybe 10 minute video. So I'm going to get into like one patient visit and I'm choosing a screening visit and I'm using Creo to help guide me, which is my site uses eSource. Okay. But we use Creo, but just keep in mind, eSource is optional. Many sites use paper source. So the data is collected on paper source, but basically let me give you like just a macro overview, and then let's go down into the details. So there's a few portals or processes, technologies sites can use, all right? One of them is electronic medical records. Now, this is not necessary for sites. Matter of fact, many sites are not affiliated with private practices, so they don't have electronic medical records because electronic medical records or electronic health records are systems that clinicians use outside of research in their private practice to document patient visits outside of research, right? So again, many research sites are standalone and don't partner with clinicians so they don't use electronic health records or electronic medical records what they what those sites need to do is somehow get access to the patient records for whatever patients they put in their study so for example if you're screening a patient you need to send a form an authorization to release medical records form that the patient signed to their provider asking them to send you relevant records mainly their medical conditions and what medications they're on and some brief medical history. You don't need their entire file. You just need the basic things to make sure the inclusion exclusion criteria is met for that patient, right? So electronic health records, whether they're electronic or paper health records, site needs to obtain those. So that's the first place where data enters this conversation. Again, Sites don't necessarily have access to electronic health records, but they need to obtain basic medical information for patients that are in their study, especially at screening visit. So let's get that out of the way. Once the patient gets screened at screening visit, the informed consent and then the rest of the visit occurs. This data, which is now study data, is recorded on source document. So that source can either be electronic source, like my site uses on Creo, or it could be paper source, literally on pieces of paper that you put in patient files. That is called source document. Sometimes the medical records I just discussed become source. When do they become source? when they are part of the inclusion exclusion criteria when they are part of the medical history when they are part of the prior con meds those are mainly where the patient actual non clinical study health records become source for the study hopefully that makes sense let me go through creo for a screening visit so you get a better idea 
Patient comes in, informed consent. We need to document on Creo, date the informed consent was signed, what protocol version it was, was this, uh, who did it? So we have to write a process of consent. Again, this is either done captured on paper or it's captured on eSource. Sponsors don't care. It's just, this is called source documentation. The next assessment for this particular visit or for this particular study and screening visit is the date of visit. What date was the visit performed? What time did the patient get trained on the diary? In this study, there's a diary. Next section is demographics. What's the patient's date of birth, age, sex at birth? Are they of childbearing potential? This is another example of where the patient's medical records from outside of research become part of source. They become integrated into study data. Then you go through inclusion exclusion criteria on the source. There's literally a checklist. For this study, there are 15 inclusion and there are 33 exclusion criteria. You have to literally go through each one and check and they ask questions like, does the patient have a history of at least six months or more of this condition? And again, without having access to the patient's medical records, you cannot complete this source properly as a site. So another example of when patient medical records get integrated with study data. Then they get into medical history. So if this patient has diabetes, hypertension, hypercholesterolemia, and allergies. How do we get that? Yes, you can get that verbal report from the patient. That's okay. But you can also, it's good clinical practice and part of ALCOA-C to obtain this for accuracy from the patient's medical records, if at all possible. So again, this is where electronic health records come in. If you're a site that has access to your PI's electronic medical records, or if you're not, you need to obtain these by having that authorization to release medical records. Then you go into regular study data captured at that visit, like vital signs. So temperature, blood pressure, heart rate. Then you get into ECG, oh, respiratory rate. Then you get into ECG. Then you get into height, weight, and BMI. Again, all captured contemporaneously. All right, if you don't know Alcoa C, you got to know it. Then you get into study-specific assessments, which I'm not going to get into, but this is one particular assessment you have to capture on the source. Then you got to do a physical exam. Then you got to do an ECG. Now, the ECG is a whole nother portal, whole nother data. You still collect it on source, but most sponsors now give you an ECG machine and you have to upload the file to their central ECG reader so they can collect the data and analyze the ECG for safety. So that becomes another data set, which there's a lot of um, redundancy because that's gonna be also captured in your site source. And we're gonna get to the EDC right now. Then clinical labs, you draw the blood, you document it all on source, what at what requisition, what accession number did you take, the time you drew the blood, the date and time the sample was collected, accession number, were there any clinical significant results, you won't know it yet, it takes a few days. Um, you got to keep all this stuff, even down to the tracking number for the shipment you send to the lab in source. That's all source. Uh, you're in drug screen. Then you have other assessments, uh, study-specific assessments. So that is a screening visit. I'm skipping a lot of study-specific assessments, which take a lot of time, which you have to capture on source. Once the patient leaves, once the patient goes home, you pay them their stipend for coming in. They go home. Now the coordinator needs to enter this data from the source into the EDC system, electronic data capture system, also known as case report forms, which are CRFs, or in the modern day, electronic case report forms. All right, so just because you capture the source on your source, even if it's electronic source, that 
needs to go on a standardized CRF that the sponsor created so that all data, because remember, there's like 30 to 50 sites, sometimes more, participating in one study. So every site uses their own tools. They might use Creo, like me. Another site might use Paper. Another site might use a Creo competitor. Another site might use another Creo competitor. So they're collecting data, but the sponsor needs something standardized for them so they can send the data results to the FDA. So this is what EDC systems are. Right. They keep it. All the data gets aggregated into an EDC system. So after the patient leaves every visit, within three days, the site needs to enter the data in the EDC. Literally everything I went through has to be entered in the EDC system. Sometimes, but not most of the time, but a lot of people are saying this is promising for the future of clinical research, the e-source will be integrated to the EDC. There is another tool, which probably will add confusion to this, but it just shows you the complexity of this industry, called an IRT. And the IRT system is what's generally used to assign a patient to a study, so give them an official screening number, give dispense medications to each individual patient, randomize patients, assign electronic patient-reported outcomes to those patients, and oftentimes, but again, not most of the time, but a lot of times, and I think increasingly so in the future, the IRT kind of serves as an intermediary between the source and the EDC. So a lot of there's a lot of study, one particular study I have right now where we enter everything in our e-source, Creo, but then we're, we also have to enter in this IRT system in order for the system to generate a patient number in the case of a screening visit or a randomization number in the case of a randomization visit, or a regular IP number, investigational product for a regular study visit. And that data does sometimes passively get entered into the EDC system. So I know that's right there is going to add a lot of confusion. Most of the time, these IRT systems do not do that, but there is a new tool branching out that is also kind of serving as a bridge between source and CRF. And I, it doesn't take a genius to see that. This is probably something that in the future is going to make the process of transferring data from source to CRF um, passive. And don't ask me why we have to record data on source and not enter it directly on EDC. A lot of sites are complaining about this. This is just the way it's always been. I don't know. We have to ask regulators that question. I don't know. But I think IRT can serve as a bridge in the future. So that's EDC. Um, so those are what we've have the electronic medical records, which most most clinics use, um, which can be converted to paper medical records for sites to use for their study. Then we have source, which all sites need, whether it's electronic or paper. Then we have EDC system or ECRF. Then we have investigational uh, product database which usually is controlled by an IRT, which might serve as a bridge between source and EDC. And then we have other portals where data is collected like ECG vendors, um, ECG vendors, lab, central lab vendors. So this is all study data being collected. Patient reported outcomes or diaries, usually controlled by an IRT, but that's a whole nother data set. So you can see data starts accumulating quite a bit throughout a study. And this is all just for one visit. This process repeats for every patient, every visit in the study. At the end of the study, or actually I should say in between, usually every quarter, the sponsor does what's called a database lock. And what that means is in the EDC system, they issue queries and they need whatever data discrepancies there are based on monitoring, based on data management, they ask sites to clarify, to explain, to provide more information, to correct, whatever the case may be, those visits at database locks become locked. So once those queries are closed and the data is considered clean, the sponsor locks that portion of data, which now can be started to put in the clinical study report, which is for the sponsor to send to the FDA. And this happens every quarter until closeout visit. Then they do a final database lock, 
And then they have, at least theoretically, a clinical study report, complete, query-free, clean, that could be sent to the FDA. Now, this is where biostat biostatisticians come into play. This is where data managers come into play. This is where regulatory affairs people come into play. This is where investors come into the mix. But when it comes to an operational standpoint, this is kind of the how data flows throughout a study. Hopefully this helps. Hopefully I didn't make it more confusing. Like, subscribe, comment, share. Bye-bye.